After 15 years of marriage, I discovered my wife's secret affair through her texts, what happened next changed my life, my kids, and left her in ruins. So, this all kicked off a few years ago, and honestly, at the time, I thought I had a pretty decent life. We were your average suburban family, you know, the kind with two kids, a mortgage, and a dog. We were doing all right financially. I worked in IT, my wife Emma was working part-time at some local health clinic, and we had two kids, Amelia, who was 14 at the time, and Jack, who was 9. I thought we were happy. I mean, we had some issues, sure. Who doesn't, after being together for 15 years? It felt like we were going through one of those rough patches people talk about, where you're both working long hours, and the connections start slipping a bit. Emma seemed stressed all the time, which wasn't unusual, but it was getting worse. I chalked it up to our son's developmental struggles. Jack was having a tough time in school, and we had meetings with teachers almost every week. Emma took it harder than me. She always had this thing where she'd internalize stuff more, you know? I figured that's what it was. Then, out of nowhere, she's on her phone a lot more than usual. Like, all the time. I'd see her sitting in the corner of the living room, tapping away like she was glued to it. If I asked her about it, she'd just shrug and say she was texting with her girlfriends. I didn't think much of it. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. I trusted her. That was my first mistake. I mean, why wouldn't I trust her? We'd been through a lot together, good and bad, and she'd never given me a reason not to. So, I started trying to make things better between us. I figured, hey, maybe if I made more of an effort at home, we'd get out of this funk we were in. I started leaving work earlier when I could, helped out more with the kids and around the house, but nothing seemed to change. If anything, it felt like Emma was pulling away even more. After a few weeks of this, I started to notice little things. Like, when I'd come home early, she'd be kind of surprised to see me. Or, when we'd sit down for dinner, she'd keep her phone right next to her, always face down, which was weird because she never used to do that. I didn't know what was going on, but I figured maybe it was just the stress. Then, one day, I was charging up an old iPad for Jack to use. We'd stopped using it ages ago, but Jack needed something for school, so I thought I'd get it up and running again. When I turned it on, I noticed Emma's Facebook messenger was still logged in. Now, I'm not the type of guy who goes snooping around, but the first message on the screen caught my eye. It wasn't from any of her girlfriends. It was from some guy named Adam. I hesitated. I knew I shouldn't pry, but something just felt off. The message wasn't super inappropriate, but it was weird. There was a lot of back and forth, some inside jokes I didn't get, and it just seemed, personal. I scrolled up a bit and noticed that some of the conversation was missing, like gaps where she must have deleted parts of it. That's when my gut told me something was up, but I didn't lose it right then and there. I tried to stay calm, think it through. I made a mental note to keep an eye on things, just in case. Maybe it wasn't anything. Maybe it was harmless. But I wasn't going to jump to conclusions. I wanted to give her the benefit of the doubt. The next day, Emma was sitting in the living room, on her phone, as usual. I casually grabbed the iPad and went to my office to check again. This time, I watched as new messages came in. Emma and Adam were making fun of me. They were talking about my flaws, stuff I was insecure about, things I had trusted Emma with over the years. It was all right there, out in the open. I felt sick. My heart dropped. I didn't know how to react. I wasn't even sure how to process it at first. Here I was, watching my wife trash talk me with some guy I didn't even know. They were laughing at me, making me the punchline. And to make things worse, there was definitely some flirty stuff going on. It wasn't outright sexting or anything, but there was a weird undertone to the whole conversation, especially when Emma started talking about our sex life. More specifically, how bad I was in bed. That hurt? Like, really hurt. I thought we were good in that department. At least that's what she always told me. I took a few screenshots of the messages, but didn't get everything. Emma was deleting parts of the conversation as it went, probably trying to cover her tracks, but I still got enough to know what was happening. I should have confronted her right then, but honestly I couldn't do it. I wasn't ready for that. So I just sat in my office, staring at the screen, wondering what to do next. Over the next couple of weeks, I kept checking the iPad. Every time she'd be on her phone texting her girlfriends, I'd log in and see what was really going on. It only got worse. The messages became more and more flirty. Adam started dropping I love yous into the conversation, and Emma wasn't shutting it down. In fact, she was all in on it. The more I watched, the less I felt like the same person. It was like a slow motion train wreck, and I couldn't look away. I knew there was no coming back from this. Eventually, I had to figure out what to do. I wasn't going to let this continue, but I also wasn't ready to blow up our whole life just yet. So I decided to get a lawyer. I wanted to know my options. I needed to know what I was up against if I decided to pull the trigger on this marriage. And that's when things started to get real. So after a few weeks of gathering all this information, I knew there was no way I could stay in this marriage. I mean, watching the woman you thought you'd be with for the rest of your life openly disrespect you like that, flirt with another guy, and then complain about you to him? Nah, I was done. But I wasn't just going to blow things up right away. I needed a plan, and I needed to make sure that whatever happened next, I'd come out of this as clean as possible. For the kids, for my sanity, and yeah, a bit for revenge too. I knew I had to play it smart, so the first thing I did was meet with a lawyer. I didn't know a whole lot about divorce laws, but I needed to find out what I was up against. I wasn't going to go in blind. The lawyer was helpful, laying everything out for me step by step. Turns out, the fact that I had those screenshots could play in my favor, but it wasn't a slam dunk. Adultery doesn't always mean you automatically win in court, especially when it comes to custody of the kids, but it could help when it came to things like division of property or alimony. So I started planning. First things first, I needed to protect myself financially. I wasn't going to let Emma drain our accounts or take more than her fair share once things hit the fan. I started opening up new bank accounts, redirected my paycheck to go to my personal account instead of our joint one, and started pulling money out little by little. Not enough for her to notice right away, but enough so that when the time came, I'd be good to go. Meanwhile, I kept up appearances at home. I didn't want her to suspect anything was going on. 
She was still spending all her time on the phone texting Adam, thinking she had me completely fooled, and honestly, it worked in my favor. The more she thought I was clueless, the more careless she got. I wasn't snooping as much at this point. I already knew enough. Now it was just about timing. Then, things escalated. One day, while I was checking the iPad, I saw something that made me stop cold. Emma and Adam were talking about him coming to visit her. Not just for a quick meetup, but for a whole weekend. A romantic getaway at a fancy hotel in the city. They were planning to spend an entire weekend together, right under my nose. Emma told me she was planning a girl spa weekend. I could barely keep a straight face when she brought it up. She acted like it was the perfect way for her to clear her head and come back refreshed so we could focus on our marriage. I played along, nodding, telling her it was a great idea. I even offered to take care of the kids while she was away. She had no clue I already knew everything. This was my chance. I knew exactly where they were going to be and when. I got back with my lawyer and had him draft up a separation agreement. It wasn't a divorce, not yet, but it outlined what would happen while we figured things out. Emma would move out, get weekend visitation with the kids, and no child support until the divorce was finalized. I wanted everything in place before I made my move. The next couple of weeks were torture. Every day, I had to act like nothing was wrong, like I wasn't seething inside. She would leave her phone lying around, texting away, all while I was right there, pretending not to notice. But I kept my cool. I had to. I needed everything to go down just right. Finally, the weekend arrived. She packed her bags, kissed me on the cheek and said, I love you. I almost laughed. She had no idea what was coming. As soon as she walked out the door, I went to the bank. I withdrew half of the money from our joint accounts. Fair is fair, right? I left her half, but I wasn't about to let her take more than that. I closed out our money market account and got a cashier's check for her half, just to be sure everything was by the book. Then, I went to Office Max and printed out 75 pages of screenshots. I wanted her to see everything. I wanted her to know that I knew. After all that, I wasn't about to sit around at home waiting. I didn't want to be there when she came back. So I decided to go straight to the hotel. I knew where they were staying and figured I'd catch them in the act. When I got to the hotel, I was nervous. I won't lie. My hands were shaking, but I walked right up to the front desk and asked if I could use the phone to call Adam's room. The front desk lady didn't even blink. She dialed the room number, and after a couple of rings, Adam picked up. Hello? He said, sounding confused. I kept my voice calm. Hey, can you send Emma down to the lobby? There was a pause. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, man. I wasn't in the mood for games. All right, I said. Then I guess I'll just call your wife and ask her to come down here instead. That got his attention. I didn't actually know much about his wife, but I knew enough to bluff. There was some fumbling on the other end, and then I hung up. A few minutes later, the elevator doors opened, and there she was, Emma, looking pale and flustered. She tried to act casual, but I could see the panic in her eyes. We sat down in the lobby, and she started with the excuses right away. It's not what you think, she said. I can explain. I cut her off. I'm not here to argue, I said. Everything I need to know is right here. I dropped the stack of screenshots on the table between us. Her face went white. I could see the wheels turning in her head, trying to figure out how to get out of this. I'm giving you one chance, I told her. If you move out immediately, I won't send these to our daughter, your parents, or everyone we know. But if you come back to the house, I'm sending these to everyone. Emma didn't even try to argue. She was too stunned. I handed her the cashier's check for half of our savings and the separation agreement. This is more than fair considering what's going on, I said. I'm going to need you to sign this and leave it at the house when you pick up your stuff. She didn't say much after that. She was on the verge of tears, but I didn't care. I'd made my point. I left the hotel feeling more in control than I had in weeks. It wasn't over yet, but the pieces were finally starting to fall into place. Update 1. So, after that whole showdown at the hotel, things at home got tense, to say the least. Emma didn't come back that night. I didn't expect her to, but it still felt weird knowing that this person I'd been living with for over a decade wasn't going to walk through that door anymore. The house was dead quiet when I got back, which I guess I should have been thankful for. No awkward conversations, no fake apologies, just silence. Over the weekend, Emma tried calling and texting me nonstop, probably looking for a way out of the mess she'd dug herself into. But I wasn't ready to deal with her just yet. I needed space to think things through, to figure out what was next for me and the kids. I kept the phone off most of the time, just letting her voice messages pile up. Every once in a while, I'd check them, but it was all the same. We need to talk. I'm sorry. It's not what you think. But I already knew what it was, and I was done with hearing her excuses. By Monday afternoon, she'd finally accepted that I wasn't going to pick up, so she sent movers to the house to get her stuff. I had this huge knot in my stomach when they showed up. It felt real now, like everything we'd built together, gone, just like that. But then, I remembered what she did, and I was able to keep my head straight. I didn't go out to watch them load up her stuff. Instead, I stayed in my office and let them do their thing. A little while later, she texted me saying she had signed the separation agreement and left it on the kitchen table. That's when it really hit me. It was done. She was gone. I took a deep breath, went into the kitchen, and there it was. Her signature on the dotted line. I couldn't help but feel a weird mix of relief and sadness. I mean, yeah, I was angry and hurt, but there's something about the finality of it that just messes with your head. Everything we had, every memory, was now boiled down to this stupid piece of paper. We sat the kids down later that day to talk. It was the hardest conversation I think I've ever had. Amelia, my 14-year-old, was already going through that rebellious teenage phase, so she kind of just stared at us with that, I don't care attitude. Jack, though, my 9-year-old, took it the hardest. He's always been more sensitive, so when we told him that mommy and daddy need some time apart, he immediately started tearing up. I felt like the worst person in the world sitting there watching their faces. But what else could I do? I wasn't going to drag them through some nasty, messy divorce. We kept the conversation simple. None of the details. Just that we still loved them, and this wasn't their fault. You could see they didn't buy it, though. 
Kids are smarter than we give them credit for. After that talk, things kind of shifted. Emma was gone, and I had the house to myself with the kids most of the time. At first, I wasn't sure how to handle it. I mean, going from two parents in the house to just me felt strange. But slowly, I got into a routine. The kids stayed with me during the week, and Emma had them on weekends. I didn't fight her on that. It gave me the space I needed to figure things out. A week after she moved out, Emma wanted to have the talk. You know, the kind where they want to try and fix things. I didn't want to meet up, but I also felt like I needed to hear her out. So we agreed to sit down and talk at a coffee shop nearby. It was awkward as hell seeing her again. She looked tired, like she hadn't slept much since everything went down. But I wasn't exactly about to feel sorry for her. She started with the usual apologies. She was sorry for what she did. Sorry for lying. Sorry for everything. And yeah, maybe a part of me wanted to believe her, but I couldn't. She didn't seem sorry when she was sending those texts to Adam. She didn't seem sorry when she was planning that spa weekend. Then, she dropped to her knees in the middle of the coffee shop. I'm not kidding. She actually got down on her knees and begged me for another chance. She was crying into my lap, saying she wanted her family back, that she'd do anything to fix it. People were staring, and I honestly didn't know how to react. I told her to get up because it was embarrassing, but she kept on pleading. Part of me wanted to stand up, walk out, and leave her there. But instead, I told her the only way I'd consider moving forward was if she set up marriage counseling on her own and did all the work. I made it clear I wasn't moving back in with her, but that for the kid's sake, I'd let her be involved. She seemed to grab onto that small shred of hope like it was a lifeline. So that's how things went for the next few months. Emma would come over to the house three nights a week to cook dinner for the kids, help them with their homework, and do their laundry. I stayed out of the way for the most part, not wanting to deal with her, but she'd always save me a plate of food like nothing had changed. It was weird. One minute she's texting some guy behind my back, and the next she's in my kitchen acting like she's still part of the family. I wasn't having it, though. I knew where things were headed, and I wasn't about to let her back in just because she was suddenly playing house again. We also went to counseling, which was honestly a waste of time. Emma would spend most of the sessions crying and trying to figure out why she did what she did, while I just sat there playing the victim. I didn't have any intention of fixing things. I just needed time. Time to establish myself as the primary parent and time to figure out what I wanted to do next. And here's the thing. I knew she was still holding on to hope that we'd get back together. That's the only reason she kept coming over, kept cooking for the kids, kept going to counseling. But in my head, I was already done. I was just playing the long game now. So yeah, that's how things were. Emma trying to act like she was fixing everything, me pretending to be open to it, but in reality, I was already looking for the next move. I wasn't going to let her control the narrative. Not this time. Update 2. So after a few months of going through the motions, I knew I had to start making some moves for myself. Emma was still coming over to the house three times a week, doing the whole perfect mom thing, but I wasn't buying it. She was trying hard to win me back, acting like we were just one big happy family again, but I knew better. I let her think she had a chance because honestly, it made things easier for me. The kids were starting to adjust to the new normal and I needed that to stay stable while I figured out my next steps. The counseling sessions were still happening, but they were pretty pointless. Emma spent most of them trying to convince me she was sorry that she was working through her issues, but I wasn't there for that. I was there to bide my time, to get things in place. I wanted to establish myself as the primary parent and to do that, I had to make sure the kids saw me as the reliable one. I wasn't about to throw all this away just to rush into something messy. I started seeing my own therapist too, which really helped me focus on what I wanted. It wasn't about fixing my marriage anymore. It was about making sure I could move forward without dragging the kids through more chaos. Emma was always trying to fix things on her end, but I was mentally checked out. The idea of staying together for the kids just didn't make sense anymore. I'd already seen enough to know that this wasn't salvageable. But here's the thing, I knew Emma still had hope. She kept trying to play nice, making dinner for the kids, cleaning the house, and acting like she could still be part of my life. I let her, because it gave me time to get my ducks in a row. I had a plan now and I needed to make sure it would work. One day I decided to leave some things out around the house for the kids to find. I wasn't sure if it was the right move, but I needed them to understand why things were happening the way they were. I left a couple of printed out articles on surviving infidelity on the kitchen counter, nothing too obvious, but not hidden either. I also left a Google search open on our shared computer about how to handle a spouse's betrayal. It was subtle, but I knew they'd see it. Sure enough, a few days later, my daughter Amelia came to me in tears. She'd found one of the articles and connected the dots. I hadn't planned on her finding it that soon, but when she did, I knew I had to it carefully. I sat her down and told her the truth. Not all the details, but enough for her to understand that her mom had made a mistake, and that's why things were different now. I reassured her that it wasn't her fault, and I'd always be there for her, no matter what. It wasn't long before Amelia's attitude toward Emma changed completely. She used to be a typical teenager, giving both of us attitude and pushing boundaries, but after she found out what her mom had done, it was like a switch flipped. She stopped talking to Emma unless she absolutely had to, and when she did, it was usually just to yell or get into some kind of argument. I could see it crushed Emma, but I wasn't about to step in and defend her. She made her bed, and now she had to lie in it. Jack, my son, wasn't as quick to pick up on things, but he followed Amelia's lead. He's always looked up to his sister, so when he saw her distance herself from their mom, he started doing the same. He didn't say much, but I could tell he was confused and hurt. I did my best to reassure him that everything would be okay, but I knew that no matter what I said, it wouldn't make it any easier for him. Watching your parents go through a separation is hard enough, but when you add betrayal into the mix, it just messes with a kid's head. A few months after that, we went to court for the custody arrangements. By this point, both kids were on my side. Amelia had made it clear she didn't want to live with Emma, and Jack, being the little shadow that he is, echoed her decision. I didn't pressure them. I wanted it to be their choice. But the way things had gone down, it wasn't surprising that they didn't want to spend much time with their mom. 
When it came time for them to make statements to the court, they both said they wanted to stay with me. Emma looked devastated, but what did she expect? The judge ended up awarding me primary custody of the kids, with Emma getting weekend visitation. It wasn't the worst outcome for her, but it was a win for me. I got to keep the house, and since I was working part-time at this point to take care of the kids, I was also awarded child support. It wasn't a huge amount, but it was enough to make things a little easier on me financially. Now, with custody settled and the divorce moving forward, I felt like I had finally gotten some control back over my life. Emma was still holding on to the idea that we could fix things someday, but I knew that was never going to happen. I had everything I needed. The house, the kids, and my freedom. I didn't want her back, but I wasn't going to flat out tell her that yet. I let her believe there was still a glimmer of hope, because it kept her from making things messy. The weekends when she took the kids were strange at first. I didn't know what to do with myself. The house felt empty without them running around, and I wasn't used to having so much time alone. But I quickly realized that this was my time to reset, to focus on me. I didn't waste it. I'd been through a lot by that point, more than I ever thought I'd have to deal with, but I was finally starting to feel like I could breathe again. The divorce wasn't finalized yet, but I knew it was only a matter of time. Emma still came over during the week to see the kids and keep up appearances, but the reality was that our marriage was over, and I was okay with that. Update 3. With the divorce finally moving forward, things started to settle down. I got in custody of the kids, Emma was paying child support, and I was living in the house. It wasn't perfect, but it was better than the chaos of the last few months. The kids were adjusting too. Amelia still wasn't talking to Emma much, and Jack had kind of followed suit, but I didn't push them one way or the other. I wanted them to feel like they had some control over the situation. After all, they didn't ask for any of this. Emma though? She was still holding on to this fantasy that we might get back together someday. I didn't say anything to burst her bubble, letting her believe that there was a chance made things easier for me. She came over a few nights a week, still doing the mom thing, still trying to act like everything wasn't falling apart, and I let her, because the longer she thought she could fix things, the less drama I had to deal with. But in my mind, I was already done. I had no intention of getting back with her, ever. I just needed to keep things calm until the divorce was finalized and everything was legally squared away. One day, a few weeks after the custody ruling, Emma came over to have one of our talks. She always wanted to talk, always trying to figure out where we went wrong, how we could fix things. I was tired of hearing it, but I went along with it for the sake of keeping the peace. She was crying again, seemed like she always was these days, and saying how sorry she was, how she wished she could take it all back. That's when she dropped the line that really got me. I still love you, she said. I know we can fix this if we just try. Now, in my head, I was already out the door. But something about the way she said it, like she actually believed we could go back to how things were, just hit me wrong. I didn't want to play this game anymore. I was done pretending. So, I looked her in the eye and said, I don't love you anymore. The room went dead silent. I could see the shock on her face. She wasn't expecting that, not at all. I guess I'd been playing the nice guy card a little too well. She thought I was still holding on to some hope, but I wasn't. Not even a little. I'm sorry, Emma, I continued, but you killed that part of me. There's no going back. For the first time since this whole mess started, I think she finally understood that it was really over. She didn't cry, didn't yell, didn't try to argue. She just sat there, staring at me like she couldn't believe what I just said. After a few minutes, she stood up and said, okay. Then she walked out the door without another word. I didn't expect it to go down like that, honestly. I figured there would be more of a fight, but I think she was just done. Like, hearing me say those words made her realize that whatever hope she had left was gone. Over the next few weeks, things started shifting. Emma stopped coming over as much. She'd still see the kids on weekends, but the midweek visits became less frequent. She wasn't trying as hard anymore, and I could tell she was finally letting go of the idea that we could fix things. Meanwhile, I was focused on building a new routine. I'd started working part-time, which gave me more time to be there for the kids and keep the house running smoothly. It wasn't easy, but it felt good to finally have some control over my life again. The chaos that had been swirling around for months was starting to fade, and I could breathe a little easier. One night, Amelia came to me with tears in her eyes. She had just gotten off the phone with her mom, and I could tell something was bothering her. I asked her what was up, and after a long pause, she finally said, Mom wants to know why you won't forgive her. I wasn't sure how to answer that at first. Amelia was old enough to understand some of what had happened, but I didn't want to drag her into the messy details. So I just told her the truth, as simply as I could. Sometimes people make mistakes that you just can't forgive, I said. Your mom did something that hurt me really bad, and it's not something I can just get over. But that doesn't mean she doesn't love you, and it doesn't mean she's a bad person. We just can't be together anymore. Amelia nodded, but I could tell she was still struggling with it. I didn't push her to talk more, though. I knew she'd come to terms with it in her own time. Jack was handling things a little better. He was more focused on school and his friends than the drama between me and Emma, which was probably for the best. As the weeks went by, Emma and I communicated less and less. Everything was starting to feel more normal, at least as normal as it could be under the circumstances. The divorce was nearly finalized, and once that was done, I knew we'd both be able to move on. Then, one afternoon, I got a text from Emma. It wasn't the usual we need to talk text. It was short and to the point. I'm filing the papers today. And just like that, it was done. The divorce was official, and I felt this strange mix of relief and sadness. I mean, I was glad it was over, but at the same time, there was a part of me that was mourning the loss of what we had. It wasn't just the end of a marriage. It was the end of a life I'd built with someone I thought I'd spend forever with. But now, that life was gone, and I had to figure out what came next. In the end, things worked out the way they needed to. The kids were with me, the house was mine, and I had a fresh start ahead of me. Emma and I would still have to co-parent, but at least now, we could do it without the weight of our broken relationship hanging over us. I'm not going to say it was easy. Divorce never is. But sometimes, you have to let go of the past to build something better for yourself and your kids. And that's what I was planning to do. 
So, after the divorce was officially finalized, things started looking up for me. I got the house, the kids, and my life back on track. I wasn't expecting things to turn out this good for me, to be honest. I thought it was going to be messy for years, but it wasn't. The kids were happy, we had our routine, and I felt like I finally had my feet back on solid ground. Emma, though? Things took a turn for the worse on her end, and I can't say I felt bad about it. She ended up moving into this tiny apartment, way smaller than our house, and she was struggling to keep up with the bills. That fancy lifestyle she had with me? Gone. The weekends when she had the kids, they hated being at her place. They complained about how cramped it was, how she couldn't afford to take them out anywhere, and how boring it was compared to when they were with me. At first she tried to make it seem like everything was fine, like she was getting by, but the cracks started showing real quick. She couldn't handle the pressure. The kids started pulling away from her more and more, and every time she had them for the weekend, they'd come back telling me how miserable they were over there. I never badmouthed her in front of them, but I wasn't about to sugarcoat things either. They saw the difference themselves. Then word got out about what happened. Turns out some people at her job found out about her affair with Adam, and it didn't go over well. The clinic where she worked had a reputation to uphold, and Emma being caught up in all that drama didn't fit with the image they wanted to present. She wasn't fired outright, but she was encouraged to leave, and she ended up having to find a lower-paying job elsewhere. That fancy part-time gig she used to brag about? Gone. Now she was stuck working long hours, and it still wasn't enough to keep her afloat. Meanwhile, I had more time with the kids, more time to focus on my life, and yeah, more freedom too. On the weekends when they were with Emma, I did my own thing. I started dating again, not seriously at first, but it was nice to get out there. And let me tell you, I wasn't struggling to meet people. I kept things low-key for the kids, but I was enjoying my newfound freedom. Emma though? She was still stuck in that tiny apartment, barely making ends meet. She tried reaching out to me a few times, asking for help, hinting at wanting to talk again, but I wasn't interested. I'd already moved on. I'd won the custody battle, kept the house, and even managed to get my career on a better track. Emma was just a memory now, one I wasn't too keen on revisiting. In the end, it worked out better for me than I ever could have imagined. I had the life I wanted, and Emma was left to deal with the mess she created. 